place was made by God, a priceless sacrament. It is without reproach. Please be seated. I am so glad to be here again. <laughs> There's a story from the Hebrew scriptures. The people are wandering in the wilderness and dying of thirst. They come to Moses and demand water, but Moses doesn't have any water, so he turns and complains, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. But God figures the problem isn't the people, God figures the problem is they need water. So God sends Moses with some of his people out into the desert to strike this one rock, and of course, water pours out of it. And scripture says that all of this happened in sight of the elders of Israel, the elders of the tribe. That last phrase is the key to the whole thing. See, yes, this is the story of a miracle. It's the waters of life in the most unlikely place. But even more, it's the origin story for the elders of the tribe. It's the first time in scripture that the tribe even has elders. It's a new job with new responsibilities made just for them. So yes, it's the story of a miracle, but the miracle brings with it all of these new expectations for the people who witness it. The miracle doesn't just change the rock and the water, it changes who its witnesses are called to be. The last time I wore this stole, we were a people thirsty in the wilderness. Today, we gather as the elders of the tribe, transformed by what we have seen and called upon for a new task. And so and now I invite you, whatever you believe, to open your hearts as I offer a blessing on our new time together. Creator of the universe, 
We gather this afternoon as elders transformed by the wilderness we have traversed. As we open our hearts to you, we offer our profound gratitude for the gift of this day and the year set before us. The gift of students who fill this campus with joy and wonder. The gift of teachers and staff and administrators who captivate and cultivate and inspire. The gift of those who have gone before and the legacy of wisdom and passion we inherit. The gift of friends and family and alumni who have stood by us even in the driest places. The gift of this time together that so easily might not have been. In our gratitude, O oh God, transform us into servants of the miracle we have seen. Grant that we may seize this hour with courage. Grant that we may honor this day with joy. Grant that we may enter this season armed with the story of what has been and with the imagination for what is yet to come. That, this, that in this and every season yet to be, we might answer your call to peace, mercy, justice, and hope. Amen. Good afternoon. As Dean of the Faculty and Vice President for Academic Affairs, I have the pleasure and great honor of welcoming many distinguished guests, the Board of Directors, alumni, faculty, staff, and students, emeriti faculty, and retirees to our 2015 Founders Day Convocation and Presidential Investiture. This is a historic day for the college, and we thank you for celebrating with the Sweetbriar community. This day would not have been possible without the unfailing support and commitment of many. To acknowledge these efforts on behalf of Sweetbriar, I am honored to introduce President Philip Stone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you'll let me make a few special introductions. All of you really deserve special attention, but I can't do that. So I do want to introduce a few people, if you'll permit it. First, I'd like to introduce my family. Would you stand? Cheryl, my wife, my sons, Phil Jr., Robert, and John, and my daughter, Elizabeth. Thank you. As you can imagine, so many people uh, uh, have done great things for the college and uh, in this rescue effort. And so if we overlook someone in the listing we made in the program or in remarks today, I apologize in advance because we did our best. But uh, we, we know many of you did things that may not be reflected in that list. I'd also like for you to know the board of uh, 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 directors here at the college. This, on July 2nd, at the end of business, they, at five o'clock, they met by telephone and uh, rescinded the order to close and elected me president. And since then, I've worked almost every week in meetings of some sort to help uh, provide support and governance for this college. Would the board please stand and let us acknowledge you? And years ago, as I learned to uh, know these ladies for the first time, it did not dawn on me that one day I would welcome them home to Sweetbriar. But I'd like to introduce Barbara Hill, former president, and Betsy Muhlenfeld, former president. Please stand. <laughs> Barbara and Betsy, welcome home. Good to have you here. We did not do a formal inauguration, as you can see, with delegates and so forth, but we did want to include in this Founders Day ceremony a few special friends from colleges who have been so close to us, and in my case, some very personal friends from my former college. And I'd like to recognize them. President and Mrs. Ken Guerin from Lynchburg, I think, are here, unless they couldn't tell us. Yeah, here they are. Thanks. <laughs> President, President Brad Bateman from Randolph College. President and Mrs. Chris Howard from Hampton, Sydney. Chris, great to have you back again. And then some special friends who came to uh, join me today from Bridgewater College. The president got called away at the last minute for a family illness, but I'd like to introduce board chairman and classmate of mine, Nathan Miller, Vice President 
Roy Ferguson, and Nick Perserno, not only Chief of Police of Bridgewater, but a consultant to this college. Thank you, Nick. I also want to acknowledge Elliot Chukart, who's one of the attorneys who uh, was involved in the case. Elliot, very good to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Elliot, this is a crowd where the presiding officer is a lawyer, so you get attention from this group so you, when you get that. All right. We're very pleased uh, to have uh, several others here who will be introduced in just a moment or acknowledged in just a moment. Uh, many people uh, participated, obviously, in this rescue effort, and many of all of you certainly participated. But one group uh, just uh, really deserves a lot of attention because of what they did, and that is Saving Sweetbriar Incorporated. Way to go. <laughs> Saving Sweetbriar raised pledges of more than $26 million and paid 12, over $12 million into the coffers of the college already. For a college that could not raise money, it's not bad. <laughs> Congratulations to all of them. I'd like to uh, call forward here to assist me with these, uh, this recognition, Sarah Clement, who is the chair of uh, Saving Sweetbriar. She's a judge in her real life. And uh, she has a couple, several resolutions to pass out as I call the names of the recipients. We'll not be asking for speeches or anything, but you know that this resolution comes from the heart of the Board of Saving Sweetbriar and from this college. Before I do that, I'd like to also give an opportunity for the Board of Saving Sweetbriar to stand. We want to acknowledge you. What a job you did. Saving Sweetbriar Board, would you stand? There we are, all the way in the back. Thank you very much. That was well-deserved recognition. So at this point, I'll call your name, and would you come forward, and uh, Sarah will present a resolution for you to take with you as a memento of the occasion and a token of the appreciation of the college for your, for your good work. Ellen Bowyer, County Attorney, Amherst County. <laughs> Where is Ellen? Where is Ellen? Yeah, here she is. Okay. <laughs> And then I have several people from Troutman Sanders, the firm who uh, led the charge in making sure that this case was won and we ended up with a change of governance and saving the college. Ashley Taylor, would you come up? <laughs> Ashley's not here, all right. Bill Hurd, former Assistant Attorney General of Virginia. <laughs> Stephen Peepgrass. Nancy Ellen Keene. <laughs> Nancy Ellen is not only a member of the Trauma Sanders firm, but I thought enough of the work she was doing, I said, come help me. She's now Vice President for Administration at Sweetbriar College. Thank you all. On May 15th, just a few short months ago, our amazing speaker reminded a grieving audience still daring to hope that the college would be saved of the fundamental role of leaders in difficult situations. She said, and I quote, successful leaders are defined by those who do not choose to give up. They choose to persevere. If you can keep a fixed vision of what is possible, you will never drown in the morass of doubt and defeat. Simply to persevere is to conquer doubt and defeat. If you join us at the table, we will persevere. She also told us, our fates are tied to one another and to the legacy of Sweetbriar College. 
And we should make it our charge to live our lives in a way that reflects the worthiness of the college's mission. In doing so, the extraordinary value of this education and the burning candle of our lives will continue to cast unabated a lovely but powerful light. And so here we are today. The refusal to give up, the commitment to hold fast to the vision of what is possible, the worthiness of the college's mission, and the fact that so many came to the table in so many extraordinary ways will certainly ensure that Sweetbriar's powerful light will continue to shine. What a difference a few months can make. That graduation speaker, the Honorable Teresa Pike Tomlinson, Mayor of Columbus, Georgia, is now also the chair of our Board of direct Directors. She and thousands of others showed us what true leaders do. They chose to persevere with the results we see all around us today. Students, faculty, staff, administration, alumni, and friends of the college, all united in their efforts to breathe life back into Sweetbriar and to make sure that it prospers well into the future. Today, we welcome her back to this stage to effect the investiture of Sweetbriar's 12th president, Philip Stone. Thank you, Chairwoman Tomlinson, for all that you have done, and welcome back to Sweetbriar. Thank you. Thank you so very much. You know, I was uh, remarking before we marched out today that never do I shed a tear in the throes of battle, but in the comfort of victory, perhaps occasionally. <laughs> so bear with me. But good afternoon, friends. You are a beautiful sight indeed. This celebration today is as surreal as it is sweet. Only four months ago, we gathered on this lovely campus, much like we do today. But the mood then was mournful, and any glimmer of hope for a better day at Sweetbriar was faint. But the determination of those who believed in the value of this respected educational institution was great. I had the honor then to address the Sweetbriar class of 2015, one which indeed was not Sweetbriar's last, but simply its latest graduates poised to change the world. Among the observations made and the call to arms sounded that day in the 2015 commencement speech was a comparison of Sweetbriar's challenge to that of another school long ago, a school which likewise stared its apparent demise in the eye. The truth is, I have referenced that Churchill speech many times throughout my career as an ode to steadfastness, but I had not previously known that the thinly veiled re references to Britain's colossal World War II struggle were rooted in the story of the imminent closure of the then Prime Minister's beloved Harrow School for Boys. With due reverence to Winston Churchill, I slightly revise his magnificent recount of a struggle worth fighting and a cause worth winning to fit the facts of our own. And I quote, another lesson I think we may take just throwing our minds back to our meeting here four months ago and now is that appearances are often very deceptive. And as Kipling well says, we must meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. You cannot tell from appearances how things will go, but for everyone, surely, what we have gone through in this period and I am addressing myself to the school, surely from this period of four months, this is the lesson. Never give in, never give in, never, never, never. 
in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense, never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. We stood all alone four months ago, and to many, it seemed that our account was closed. We were finished. All this tradition of ours, our songs, our school history, this part of the history of this country were gone and finished and liquidated. Very different is the mood today. Sweetbriar College, others thought, had drawn a sponge across her slate. But instead, our alumni and stakeholders stood in the gap and there was no flinching and no thought of giving in. And by what seemed almost a miracle to those outside these mountains, though we ourselves never doubted it, we now find ourselves in a position where I say that we have only to persevere, to conquer. We are here today by force of will and faith to celebrate the resurgence in an extrinsic and intrinsic value of liberal arts education and women's colleges. During our recent journey, many pondered how and why it was Sweetbriar College of all colleges that faced this potential death sentence. Perhaps it was predestined that Sweetbriar would be the bellwether of this higher education litmus test. And is an education in science and technology alone enough? Must higher education be monolithic to be effective or successful? The answer this summer was a resounding no. Yet the test and the challenge will continue. And we are ready for it. We have marshaled the most extraordinary board of directors solution makers, pragmatists, succeeders. They are capable and determined and devoted to this cause. We have sounded the bell, calling to action our mighty alumni, trained by this very institution to persevere and to lend valuable aid. We have renewed essential partnerships with our accomplished and devoted faculty and staff. We have welcomed back students who love this institution because of the opportunities it affords them to become remarkable women leaders. We have found allies and friends along the way who too are committed to the cause of women's education. And most importantly, we have found an esteemed leader to take the helm and guide our course. A man who did not have to heed the call to serve, but did. And in doing so, has helped change the course of our history to one set for greatness. Philip Stone is a graduate of Bridgewater College in Virginia, the University of Chicago School of Economics, and the University of Virginia School of Law. He is a renowned leader who has established a successful career as a lawyer and was elected to serve as the president of the Virginia State Bar. He is well known in the circles of higher education, having served as president of Bridgewater College, chairman of the NCAA Division III President's Council, and chairman of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, the accrediting agency for 11 southern states. He is joined in life by his wife, Cheryl, their four children and four grandchildren. He has an unshakable commitment to higher education and to exceptionalism. He is precisely the person we need for this moment in time, and we are immensely grateful he has come our way. President Stone, will you please come forward? I will now administer the oath of office. Philip C. Stone, you have been named by the directors of Sweetbriar College to be its 12th president. Your influence will fall across the paths of many faculty, staff, students, alumni, parents, and fellow administrators. 
It is the hope and expectation of the directors that in the fulfillment of your task, you will bring to and call forth from the members of this educational community the highest in scholarship, the best in teaching and learning, and the finest of our heritage and our culture. To these ends, I pledge you the support and assistance of the directors of the college. By the authority vested in me by the charter and bylaws of Sweetbriar College, and on behalf of the board of directors, I do now declare you president of Sweetbriar College and deliver to you the presidential medallion charging you to carry out faithfully the duties and responsibilities of the office. I now present to you, friends of Sweetbriar College, our 12th president, Philip C. Stone. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are very conscious here at Sweetbriar College that we are making history. The heroic and highly successful efforts to save this college after the announcement of its permanent closing reflects heroic efforts and has caught the imagination of people across the country. It is another story of David against Goliath the underdog overcoming the tremendous odds against success. We all cheer for anyone who can win when it looks like there is no chance of winning. Making history means taking control of one's destiny, rejecting fatalistic surrender to what appears to be inevitable loss or death, and creating a new reality Many are daunted by the challenges faced by all small residential liberal arts colleges, all small liberal arts colleges. That is the shrinking share of the market for students, the difficulty faced by parents to finance education, the difficulty of schools to raise enough money to make college affordable and to provide the kind of resources, faculty and otherwise, to provide an excellent education. Some are so daunted by those circumstances that they have concluded that our demise is certain. There is such a fatalism and determinism that we can only say that some will go sooner than others. We have rejected that. For Sweetbriar College, we faced a couple additional challenges. Women's colleges have been closing in large numbers. So another circumstance to throw in our face about how we could not do it. And our own board and administration said we couldn't do it. And so another challenge for us to face that might not be contended with by other schools. And yet we've done it. The statistics and the trends were not accepted as fatal or as predetermined. What has been accomplished here since March 3rd is just incredible. It is hard to find any precedent for a school being saved by its alumni and good friends after a board and administration based on rational facts, to be honest about it, concluded that it was not possible to survive. Saving Sweetbriar raised over $12 million, I've mentioned that, in cash, and more than that in pledges already. So what happened after the July 2nd transfer of governance? We were left with a faculty, many of whom had left the campus because they needed to find jobs. And we had a, number of, a good number of staff who left. Re -accredit our accreditation was being suspended because we weren't going to be open. We had all those problems you know about. We were basically on the edge of closing even when we knew we were going to be here because so many steps had been taken toward the closing. So with that faculty and staff decimated by the plan closing, no student body, and in the face of all the steps taken to close, 
we still opened on time and without a glitch. We, had a, we have a strong student body. We have a class that will graduate on time in 2016. We have an, an experienced, outstanding faculty remaining on our campus and ready to teach and a staff necessary to do the work of having this college operate smoothly. We demonstrated, we demonstrated as a live example that Sweetbriar, at Sweetbriar College, the impossible, you know the rest, <laughs> is just another problem to solve. By any, any definition, by any definition, we've made history. For the role so many of you and others around the country played in this dramatic achievement, I express deep appreciation on behalf of this college. Not since the death of Indiana Fletcher Williams has such generosity been poured on these grounds. By making history, but making history means more than observing the change of circumstances, even against overwhelming odds. It requires active participation. Spectators are not needed to make history. They have no role to play except to cheer. We made history by participating and continuing to participate in that history. Students who were willing to invest again in this college or to come for the first time for a college that had this announcement of closing. Friends who contributed so generously of their financial resources those of the alumni who came here to polish and paint and weed and clean to make the campus ready to open. Faculty who were willing to stay in their place and take their chances that this college would stay alive and their students would be back. Joined by ranks of others who wanted to come in and be part of this making history. Staff members who kept the faith with this place and kept it clean and open and operating. A community led by people like Ellen Bowyer and the board that she represents professional institutional friends who were willing to help us in closing, but also help us as we tried to stay open. Law firms, consultants, other organizations who provided counsel and expertise. Believe me, you were not observers. You made history. But I call on us to stay the course as we make history. We need to make history that matters. It must have content. We must give it some value. We must give it some substance. It's, that's still in our hands. That's to be done. Saving the college was critical. We couldn't go anywhere else without that. But now the challenge is, how do we not only save the college, but make it flourish and save it for noble purposes? There are lots of people who may get a chance to change history. Some of the most graphic evil examples are Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, and Joseph Stalin. They changed reality for our nations, for the world. They made history, but they made it for ignoble purposes. Sweetbriar College cannot rest on its laurels of having made history by proving that a small women's college can stay alive through the efforts of its alumni and friends, as remarkable as it is. That will go down to the annals of higher education as one of the great achievements of all time. It's not enough. The time is all now here when we must have the values of Sweetbriar preserved in history. We must demonstrate that liberal arts, private liberal arts, residential colleges are going to survive and remain part of the fabric of higher education in America. We are going to provide leadership for America. And so at, at Sweetbriar College, for us to have value and substance to this historical event, teaching must continue to be outstanding, scholarship must be encouraged, the arts must flourish, Students must learn not only intellectually, but values and how to be good citizens. We will teach leadership and develop leaders. Can anyone doubt that this place teaches leaders? Uh, you have really seen it uh, lived out. At Sweetbriar, we also must demonstrate in the way we constitute ourselves as a community that we give substance to making history, that we give value to that opportunity to make history. We must be kind and civil to each other. We must accept diversity of opinion and persons. We must also make sure that we are not wedded to the past and talking about criticisms and anger and acrimony, 
Time has passed. That's gone. We will not let negativism drag us down as we face the future boldly and creatively and with excitement. We must go forward with optimism, idealism, and confidence that the cultural, social, and academic traditions of this institution will endure, acknowledging and respecting every member of this community, both on campus and at large, committing ourselves to excellence in every aspect of campus life, acknowledging the diversity, developing each student to her fullest potential, and strengthening the creative and artistic expressions of the community, becoming global citizens, taking responsibility for our society. In short, just as today we look back on 1901 and the founding of this institution and celebrate the gift of the founder, in 114 years, we want people to gather here for Founders Day and look back on our time and say they made history. As we think of that, as we think of that, we want this unbelievable rescue to be followed by a new burst of energy, creativity, growth, and renewal to the commitment that every, to the commitment to the very soul of Sweetbriar. If we do this, we will truly have made history. This is our time. It is our place. We will save the college. We will assure the vision endures. We will keep the faith of the founder. At Sweetbriar College, the roses still bloom. President Stone, we have another special presentation to make to you today. During the darkest days of the 2015 battle, we had many people come together in partnership to aid the college financially, as you referenced. And there's a renowned uh, artist here, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Solovey, who's a graduate of VMI. He got together with a local businessman, Jimmy Slaughter, and also a Sweetbriar grad, Sharon Watts Turner, 1991 and they actually were selling his art to benefit Sweetbriar College online to tremendous financial benefit and he wanted the original to be presented to you on this momentous occasion and it is called giving us wings since 1901 and so to you sir from the artist Michael Sullivy Yes, and he could not be here today. He's overseas, but he has written a lovely letter which will be presented to you of his heartfelt commendation on this special occasion. And Mrs. Stone, for you, the alumni has purchased a locket for you to, sign to signify our gratitude for your commitment to this great cause. Thank you, ma'am, so very much. Psalm 37, 30 through 31 says, The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. 
The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall falter. Friends and colleagues, fellow elders of this tribe, go into this day and into this season with courage. May you, this day and every day to come, honor this place, this people, and this story with your imagination. May you, this day and every day to come, serve this community and the community of all creation with conviction. And may you exalt at the joy and love that pulse at the very heart of the world this day and every day yet to come. Amen. <laughs>